All right. Well, I guess just to start off, um, I so I saw um, I, I recently started watching uh, somewhat adjacently to other creators, Socialism Done Left, and uh, I I think it was actually the first stream of his that I caught, uh, which was uh, re- really quick. Is is he he him? Is uh, any pronouns? Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be yeah, sure. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. I should have I should have uh, mentioned that before uh, pronouning him, but. Um, anyway, so, uh, the first stream of his that I caught was, uh, probably no, not any different than any, than any regular stream, but it happened to be a stream where he was, uh, he spoke with you for about maybe an hour or two about MMT. And Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to talk with people about MMT generally. Um, and, uh, we can talk about the descriptive side and the prescriptive side, um, a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to have this conversation because it's it's a new thought and I've got some issues with it, but maybe these issues are a little bit unfounded. I've I've watched um the, the Paul Krugman of MMT, Stephanie Kelton. I've watched like basically every interview she's done, every podcast she's done, uh okay. trying to learn about it because I want to eventually do a video on it. And uh mm-hmm. so, you know, from your side, you know, would you consider yourself a modern monetary theorist do you, would you would you subscribe to the idea um i would definitely say so yeah i get a lot of uh flack whenever i talk to other econ people because i say like i think modern money theory is probably the future of of econ right like especially the monetary side um it's just kind of like a complete paradigm shift in how people approach like thinking about money and how money works um, I think there's a lot of antiquated ideas that are sticking around in econ, probably just because they're they're common, and modern money theory kind of ignores a lot of those. Uh, but it comes to a lot of the same conclusions, right? Um, as as neoclassical or classical or especially Keynesian economics. Uh, I don't know what to equate it to in like another scientific field. It's kind of like uh, I don't know. Imagine that doctors knew to wash their hands before the germ theory of disease came around. And then these new germ theory, like these new germ theorists came around and said like, oh, this is why washing your hands is good. And then some doctors were like, yeah, we already knew that you should wash your hands. And then some doctors said like, oh, but this germ stuff is a bunch of BS. I feel like that might be, for lack of a better analogy, that's kind of a good analogy with how I currently understand MMT and the rest of uh, mainstream economics. Okay. That makes sense. I, so I think that, um, I think the general sentiment that I've shared on my Reddit account, um, not necessarily through Twitter, I, I think Reddit right now is my main uh, social media and interaction with uh, the, the the broader sort of politics and economics community, um, is that the the descriptive side of MMT, I, I don't even think can really be argued with, right? The idea that you have more fiscal space if you can issue debt in your own currency, which is probably the most fundamental idea in MMT that predicates virtually every MMT sort of style idea. I agree with that. It even actually affects, um, there's actually quite a bit, uh, Randall Ray, W-R-A-Y, he dedicates like a whole section of his book to, um, even if you have a currency peg, as long as you issue your own currency, you can still do a whole bunch of stuff. So I think that is definitely hit the nail right on the head. Right. I mean, I, I think that with a... I, I, I'd be interested to read that. I'm, I'm not sure how that could be true because if you, even if you're issuing debt in a foreign currency, you still have to have a, you still have to come up with the foreign currency that you're pegging your currency against. Um, so just inflating your currency wouldn't, I, I, I'd have to read it. But um, yeah. I think that the descriptive side can't really be argued against, right? Th- this is true. Obviously, if, you, if you're paying people in dollars you create, I mean, you can theoretically just, do a, anything you want with those dollars, right? I mean, you can have a lot of them and you can uh, have a lot of fiscal space and, and do a lot of good projects. Um, I think the second idea, uh, the second order idea, which is that if you've got productive capacity in the economy, then it's not necessarily the case that uh, deficits would lead to inflation, which is is reasonable as well. Obviously, if you, uh, you know, two things, if you, if you print a trillion dollars and give it to... Um, I think of a well-developed injury, you know, you give it to like the uh, utility industry. Well, they probably don't have a lot of space to really like just, you know, double the amount of, you know, electricity uh, distribution centers because, I mean, 
we've already got the capacity. So you're probably yeah. just wasting money. And that's where inflation can come from. And at the same time, if you print a trillion dollars and bury it in the woods, um, this isn't going to cause inflation because it's not going anywhere. Right. Um, yeah. But if you were to spend money on things like infrastructure or education or building hospitals or something, you know, th these are things that provide a return and circulate money pretty well. Um, that's these are these are fair things. Um, the descriptive side is 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 reasonable, but the prescriptive side is where uh, I kind of totally lose. You, you just you know, it, I get lost on MMT, right? Not that I don't understand it, I just don't seem to agree with the descriptive side uh, in general. And like so, how any policy recommendations? You mean like stuff like that? Well, kind of right, like that. right, okay. yeah. I mean, I think that the the main things are that you know, if you like the idea. The descriptive side of MMT, I don't think is new. I think that they're accepted ideas that are being repackaged to form the prescriptive, the prescriptions of MMT, which are controversial. However, even the prescription, which is like, hey, you know, deficit spending on productive things uh, doesn't necessarily cause inflation and it's not necessarily unsustainable if it's in your own currency. Even that is a relatively accepted idea in economics. I, I don't think there's many economists who disagree with the idea of like productive deficit spending. Um, but with Kelton's idea of managing inflation through the fiscal state and perpetually keeping interest rates to zero um, and essentially uh, removing the central government's, uh, the, well, the monetary system's role in controlling prices, um, this is where I get uh, lost on MMT. I, I can't. I, I I just can't see how that would end up uh, going well, you know. But maybe you can speak to that. Okay. Um, I'm not too familiar with uh, what Kelton argues. Um, just a lot. I, I'm just. Uh, I guess I want to speak first to the fact that these are kind of old ideas. So that's definitely true. Um, there's this old economist called i believe his name is michael eines i-n-n-e-s uh and he kind of put forward this idea of like a lot of the ideas i think it's called the credit and state theory of money or something um and so i don't think that anything in modern monetary is necessary necessarily true uh, from what i understand it's called modern money theory uh because it's kind of the most current uh set of theories that we have evidence for like that this is how it works right like you said there's not really a lot of arguing with the descriptive side of, of modern money theory uh i think that it's probably not the best named thing uh out there uh so what was the what's like the the specific policy by kelton that you you had an issue with well like the you interest rates really low Right. So the, the main prescription of MMT based on the descriptive side is that we should manage inflation through the fiscal state, that we shouldn't like it's an inefficient way to manage prices through the Federal Reserve. And that okay. the fiscal uh, state is a better mechanism, you know, basically because of that productive capacity, because of targeted fiscal deficits to manage inflation. You know, this is where I, I think, uh, you know, putting Congress in charge of managing prices just seems like such a disastrously terrible uh, policy. What, you don't think the federal government is one of the most flexible and efficient bodies on the face of the earth? Well, not, I mean, not the Congress, you know, I mean, the Federal <laughs> Reserve is, is extremely flexible and efficient. Um, and that's why I like it. Um, but I, the, I mean, the Congress, yeah. I mean, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, so like if, if we were to design, if economists could design a, a country from the ground up um, and you disregard Pinochet's Chile, which is, you know, kind of a time when that happened for the worse. Uh, if they could have like this this board in charge of uh, fiscal spending and taxation uh, that could be as dynamic and responsive as the, the Federal Reserve, I think that Kelton kind of hits the nail on the head there. I think the problem with the way that the Fed manages inflation is it kind of treats inflation... And this is also how many economists and even the general public think about inflation as something that just happens to the entire economy as a whole, when really inflation is just the change in any price level, right? Like we use, uh, I believe the Fed uses the uh, the PCE or the, oh God, personal consumption expenditures, I believe, or they may use the consumer price index. I forget which one. Um, and this is just like an aggregated bundle that they keep track of the price of, but that's not the entire economy right and that's 
you also could have a bunch of changes within that index and still have the same value. So there could be inflation in some areas of the economy, uh, certain goods. Um, I'm having to try to not uh, slip into like leftist terminology here. I've been talking with leftists for like a long time. <laughs> I'm trying to use like economic terms here. If I slip, if I use the word commodity, know that I mean it in like a Marxist sense, right? Yeah, no uh, worries. Okay. Um, so I think if you if you're looking at the economy as uh, a way that yeah it is just a bunch of individual goods and they each face their own type of inflation uh, then it does make sense because the Federal Reserve can really only increase the they can increase the monetary supply but only in kind of these weird areas of the economy or the economy as a whole which really doesn't impact inflation all that much let me explain so like if you've got too much money in the sector like in in making houses right if you got much money there it's not like the fed can step in and impose higher interest rates just on the housing market and curb inflation there that's just not within their capacity right like they might be able to do something really finagling but they also like to seem independent and, and, and hands off so they're definitely limited in some ways whereas if the if congress right in its infinite wisdom were somehow able to go in they're much more capable of going directly into the housing market and putting a tax which modern money theory just views as the deletion of of money so i i think that if you look at it from that aspect where you can as the federal government and not the federal reserve go in and create money in certain areas and delete money in other areas that's kind of really what in, in inflation is right like it's a per good or per service phenomena that you could also say kind of happens to the whole economy so yeah, again, Congress may not be the most effectively capable of doing that, but in theory, they'd be much more capable than the central bank. Right. And I think that, that that's something that I spoke to on Reddit and more broadly, which is the idea that like, even in my thought, like if I was talking to Dr. Kelton about this, my, my, I think my response would essentially be that, you know, even if it could be provably shown, like causally, experimentally, definitively, no argument shown that um, it could be more efficient, uh, theoretically, to have the fiscal state uh, manage the uh, you know inflation of the economy, um, there, there's, there's another axis that's not being taken into account, which is the political axis, right? Like, even if it's more efficient for, for, for Congress, like the 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 benevolent you know economically long term thinking Congress in this fantasy world to to manage inflation well I mean it, it, it's so precarious right I mean putting elected officials in charge of uh, inflation I mean we've we've seen we've run that experiment before and it doesn't ever seem to work out you know <laughs> uh, the stagflation pre you know pre nineteen seventy nine uh, many many other governments that have that have seriously struggled when they don't have independent uh, you know, monetary systems. Um, if you were to combine like expansive fiscal policy that MMT advocates for with an independent banking system that can that can monitor and and control inflation if it were to get out of hand, uh, that's where I think uh, it makes sense. I, I know that Kelton has argued for uh, not necessarily putting like Congress at large in term you know in charge of managing fiscal policy, but uh, instituting kind of a technocratic body that would that would filter out um, fiscal packages. So like, oh, well, what if Congress proposed something, but before it went to a vote, it had to be looked at by a team of economists that would determine its effect on inflation. And if inflation were to theoretically get out of hand by this bill, it wouldn't be allowed to be voted on. And that is that's in theory possible, but it, I don't know if there's an appetite for a technocratic body controlling how much taxes you pay and how much, uh, you know, how much fiscal uh, stimulus stimulus you receive. Right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, the, America obviously uh, doesn't, doesn't care for not being able to vote on tax policy uh, <laughs> historically. So I, I definitely <laughs> there's a, uh, a more consequentialist, uh, I guess, argument you can make against that approach. So I actually dislike the the fact that our central bank is as independent as it is. Um, I know that it's like supposedly good for controlling inflation and all this other stuff, but you've you've kind of got these people that you're basically just trusting to be benevolent dictators for uh, however many years that they're they're sitting on the post, right? Like it used to be banks that had 
a say in who the members of this was. And so they're definitely not going to have the public best interests at hand. They're going to have their own best interests, right, as in the forefront of their mind. Um, and yeah, like it generally so happens that the economy doing well is also in the best interest of them, but this isn't always the case. So I think if you look at the U.S. Congress right now uh, and how we elect stuff, I would probably agree that it's probably not the best body uh, to to put in charge of, you know, maybe the the kind of stuff that a, a modern money theorist would would want them to be in charge of. But I think it is better than, say, like putting the the currently like basically unelected body that is the the Federal Reserve in charge of it. So, uh, I do have a background in poli sci. I don't have a degree in it because. I don't know, college, right? It's a scam. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that uh, is kind of important when you're looking at how people behave in office is you need to think about something called time horizons, which uh, from my understanding, uh, econ also deals with a little bit, uh, at least the game theory side. So political parties have longer time horizons than individual candidates do. Right, they're just around for a lot longer. Right, they're going to compete in elections for longer than individual candidates are, and so they can focus on goals that are longer term uh, than candidates do. And in the U.S., we have very candidate-focused elections. So whenever an economist says like, "Oh, the U.S. Congress, they're always short-term. They're always worried about getting reelected." Makaki case, that's that's true, right? But in the U.S., our elections are very candidate-focused. When you look at some of these other countries that have like political parties as uh, an official part of the election system, right? Like where you go in and you pick the party that you want to vote for, or you rank your parties, right? Uh, they have much, much longer time horizons. And also when you have more than two parties, you also just get greater accountability, right? Like if you're, you, you always have another option to vote for, I guess, in a sense. So as the US exists right now, uh, I think that the problems of putting elected officials in charge of, of stuff like this would definitely be an issue, but I don't think it's inherent to it being a government body that's elected. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's not totally unreasonable, but I just, I'm not, the problem is that I think you, you the, the experiment has been run before though, right? I mean, that that's kind of where I, I draw from. And the U.S. is different. We're special, greatest nation in the world or whatever. I get that. But, you know, the the... Uh, I, I, I don't know if the U.S.'s uh, monetary policy and, you know, uh, governing economy could be uniquely uh, advantaged by having a more elected and uh, people-facing Federal Reserve. Um, I think that this is an area where uh, we, you know, criticize the financial institution's ties with the Federal Reserve. That's not an unreasonable criticism to make. Um, you know, the Department of the Treasury is largely similar as well with the criticisms that, you know, why don't we break up the banks and financial institutions, things like that. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if the answer is making these positions more people facing um, or to simply reform the sort of mechanisms by which their membership is selected um, through a representative system. I mean, currently, the, you know, the members of the FMOC, the FOMC and the, uh, uh, the, the chair of the Federal Reserve are obviously nominated by the democratically elected president, appointed by the democratically elected uh, U.S. Senate. Um, and so it, to me, in terms of determining membership, it seems like we've done a, a good job of that, considering the replicability of the system across the world with the central banks across nations uh, and uh, you know, going from there. Um, people have even argued for, like with the Supreme Court, uh, having a having a, even a more technocratic uh, uh, selection process where uh, the president only selects kind of like how they do. I believe uh, the UK does this where the uh, judge membership is selected uh, not by the executive, but by a committee of lawyers who filter out applicants. And people have argued for the same thing, uh, uh, you know, for judges here to actually make them more independent from the political process, not less. Okay, I think that independence from the political process is kind of not all that it's cracked up to be. So on the topic of like technocrat versus non-technocrat, uh, the government is not filled with idiots, just like corporations aren't filled with idiots, right? We often interpret what they're doing as idiotic uh, because they're often not working in our best interest, right? Like they're working for someone else's best interest. So when you look at, say, 
like uh as my one poli side professor likes to call them the nordic wonder economies because i guess it's so crazy that if you just you know do what the researchers tell you that your country starts working out better it's a miracle um it's not that like they're filled with the smartest people on earth right i i think that when you look at it right like they have much more democratic institutions that we do and so the decisions that they make are going to benefit the public so yes it is true that like we have these democratic bodies picking the the members of the federal reserve i think that going in the the position where there's more independence and thinking that they would therefore be more qualified and that it's kind of politics that's making them do bad things i think that's a a, a little naive and like politics is sort of everything that happens whether economists like to you know agree with it or not um it's kind of all that's happening and uh, speaking to the supreme court uh the supreme court used to not have uh its kind of position of supremacy if that sounds odd that the supreme court wouldn't be as supreme in authority as it used to be it's kind of only after world war ii that that happened especially uh the thought that oh it should be independent from politics right i guess this is kind of getting on a bit of a, a moral argument here but when you look at like say you had someone managing the funds for your local homeowners association and you said, okay, we're not going to elect them because we don't want them to be involved with, you know, all this NIMBY and YIMBY, right? Oh, for anyone not involved in like urbanism, NIMBY is not in my backyard. YIMBY is yes in my backyard. Like all this, all these politics, right? Why would you expect them to somehow work in the best interest of like the homeowners when whether or not they get to keep their job is dependent on whoever puts them there, right? So I don't know when... When you look at the Federal Reserve, it's it's who's it accountable to, right? And you're like, okay, can they be like like yeah, the, the people who chose them are elected democratically, but it's kind of like uh, in China where they uh, like yeah, there's elections, but all the candidates are approved by the Communist Party. Like yeah, you've got a a choice, but the choice has been made for you beforehand, right? Like it's not like you or I could ever chair the the Federal Reserve in the same way that we could one day hope to be on you know any local government board or even like a a member of congress right well i I think you could i mean it's it's just a matter of having the qualification right i mean uh, i think that these institutions are susceptible to uh, partisanship anyway right so we found that um you know i i think that trump uh he certainly tried to appoint some batshit crazy people on to the federal reserve board uh including the people that who like wanted to abolish the federal reserve bring us back to the gold standard right like all that well that yeah sense. there were there were two people who he tried to nominate who uh were in favor of the gold standard which is i mean I, look if you're look if you're in favor um i think that so i i remember um i can't remember who i watched that said this was like um one way to gauge how crazy someone's politics is is to ask them how many Jews died in the Holocaust, and if they hesitate at all on the answer, you you've already you you learned everything you need to know. And I think one thing to ask someone about see how crazy their economic views are is, do you believe in a gold standard? And if the answer isn't an immediate no, what the fuck is wrong with you? I mean, that's just such a crazy thing to to think. And um. At least economically it is, you know, I mean, you can make a moral argument, I guess, or some weird, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, but he tried to appoint those two people. But um, the 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 Congress has viewed the Fed as so it's so important that it is robustly independent and shielded from a fringe belief that um, those people actually never got. uh, They actually never were put on the the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, I think that you know, while it's susceptible to that kind of thing, I, I don't think that the answer necessarily is, you know, you, well, to be fair, you haven't suggested a specific reform, but I don't think generally the answer is making making the roles more people facing, more susceptible to, to partisanship, because what I imagine is is a world where, um, y- 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 you know, I, I was reading about the Alon government in Chile, right? And um, the... The short-term implications of the Alond economic policy was. Oh, yeah, uh, Yende. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm good. God, yeah. I'm. I of course I'm pronouncing it wrong. 
Uh, or, uh, you can always tell when someone reads something first, so I will not make fun of you for being yeah. well read. But yeah, uh, um, Allende is the same. Yeah, Allende. I should have I should have known that actually, but because um, the two L's should make a Y sound. But um, but Allende, his his uh, his policies, um, what they resulted in in the short term was an ex- you know an expansive deficit, uh, huge social program, social spending, and for you know six to twelve months. Um, you know there was great increases in wages there were um there was a, a more equality in wages and things like that but it was so expansive that it created huge inflation problems the country couldn't get credit and then almost immediately after these policies were implemented um the essentially the the fiscal state and all of the gains made were uh followed by even worse uh you know losses in those same metrics i talked about previously and that's kind of what I would worry about with regard to a fiscal state you know, or a, 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 an inflation state managed by uh, more public opinion than independent economic, you know, technocracy. That um, oh yeah, let's just run the economy hot because short term game, short term thinking, short term game, short term thinking, yeah. um, rather than this this view of long term stability, inflation, and 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 targeting. Okay, uh, I guess I've got three things. So. Uh, first off, I don't think that more technocratic is an automatic result from less public facing or less public accountability, right? I don't think anyone goes and points at like the regimes of Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein and Saudi Arabia as being particularly technocratic, despite the fact. Of that course, they... well, we're we're talking about like very specifically. I'm not talking about getting rid of democracy. Just like very no, specifically I mean, like, regarding price stability uh, and interest yeah, rate policy. Well, I mean, yeah. These, yeah. So I, uh, in terms of democratic bodies making decisions that might be hard to make, right? Like, because I feel like this is kind of the argument that everyone makes is these elected officials would when faced with the option of decreasing spending in order to curb inflation or keeping spending high and having inflation they would always make the decision of keeping inflation high because you know it's good for them to get reelected or something so i think that the main issue here is the fact that government bodies that are elected or any body that's elected isn't necessarily that short term in its thinking also despite the fact that inflation is you know bad and that might not get them reelected anyway if you look at uh the countries which suffer from famine democracies don't suffer from famine and famines usually require like substantive amounts of wealth redistribution which like if it's meant to be politically unpopular to do something like that well it's supposedly these less democratic bodies that are outside of politics that should have an easier time of doing something like that yet it's only democracies that don't suffer from famine right so when these actual hard decisions need to be made it turns out that okay yeah people just do make the decisions that make the people who got them into the place that they are happy right so the federal reserve right now it might be doing its job perfectly fine but i think it's just a little bit of a coincidence that the well-being of the people who got them there also coincides with the well-being of everybody. Now, should I do I think that we should just like elect the members of the Federal Reserve? Probably not. There is a lot of technical knowledge that that goes in there, but in the same way that we don't elect the members of the cabinet and those are more technocratic positions, uh I think that it should probably be along the same lines where there's more accountability. From my understanding right now, once you're on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve or any position like uh, the FOMC or, or anything, you're kind of just there until your term runs out. And I think that's just horrible for accountability, right? Like in, in a lot of countries, they have what's called a recall vote, which is your elected official. You can actually petition and then have a special election to recall them. Only some states in the US have that. But whenever I explain that to people, they're like, that's a genius idea, right? Like, why should we have to... S- be stuck with this person if they're doing a bad job so if the federal reserve were kind of acting more like an executive department where we expect them to be technocratic right like we don't elect all these people who we want to have specialized knowledge but we expect them to be able to be accountable to the people right i think that that would probably be the better way of going about it but if you want to talk about modern money theory and less i don't know the philosophy for how well no i mean it's it's well no but it's it's a it's a core component really of 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 mmt's uh prescriptive yeah. side which was you know that that really the fiscal state should manage inflation and you know 
I think that to round out this discussion, what I would say is that it, the discussion on the on the independence of the Fed, I, I would say that mm-hmm. um, it reminds me of a of a special that I heard from John Oliver, uh, and he did it on okay. medical examiners, and it was uh, medical examiners, uh, probably more uh, colloquially uh, referred to as uh, coroners, are pretty much the people who like people die and they decide how they died. Right. Um, you know, the, right. we, we've all, we've all seen the CSI like body on the table and the guys like, Oh, look at this bullet that I just, whatever kind of thing. Right. And, Oh, okay. I didn't know that they had a, a euphemistic term. I don't know why people do this. And so like, like grave digger, call yourself an undertaker, my guy. Right. Like I'd wear that <laughs> with a, a badge of pride. I'd get it tattooed yeah. across my chest. But you know, you, you die and a medical examiner, um, you, you know, determines the cause of death, basically. And um, this is yeah. very important for criminal cases, because if you were murdered or stabbed or, or found dead, then uh, how you died kind of can help frame the investigation and the outcomes of an investigation. And what John Oliver pointed out was that, um, I can't remember the distinction. I think it was that medical examiners are trained doctors but coroners even though they do the same thing coroners are actually elected officials right okay interesting and it's like yeah and it's like well what the fuck like (laughs) why do why electing the coroner like yeah Yeah, like 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 what are we gonna are we gonna elect the guy who designs the bridge next like no like you (laughs) you have to have like you you have to have like a a an, a very technical expertise for this position. You have to be a doctor. Yeah. You know what the hell? Like I, I think okay, yeah. So this is a this is a big thing. I think that uh, I've, I've had this argument with people before actually. Um, so elections don't ensure that the most qualified person gets into the position. They just ensure that the person in a position of power answers to the the public, right? So should we elect a coroner? uh i would probably say <laughs> probably <no>. not <laughs> yeah and right? you can see like, where i'm going corner. with that you know obviously yeah, right? you know the federal I, reserve I, very technical mm-hmm. bodies should be run by technical you know people absolutely right? I, mean, the, I think yeah. that the making the federal reserve directly elected is probably not the way to go because what would probably end up happening is that there would then be like this group of people below the elected people who ended up actually doing all of the policy stuff in the same way that congress people have uh staffers and whatnot that like give them information on stuff you always have like these people who are informed on on what's going to happen that the the actual elected people are kind of relying on so uh in the same way that some places elect judges and we see how that works out which is where they just give more guilty verdicts around uh election time right and that's obviously not a policy we want we want them to be you know judges right that are fair um i think that just having the judge be someone who is appointed from on high for all eternity right like you're still going to have this issue where you're going to get judges making probably bad decisions and now what do you do they're not accountable to everyone so you want a technocrat who is also accountable to the right people right like as i said governments aren't stupid right uh saudi arabia has a lot of technocrats running their their oil fields right and they aren't elected and they were able to put them in that place, right? And the U.S. has a lot of technocrats currently running the Federal Reserve and a bunch of other government agencies that, you know, aren't elected where they are. And they're probably the same level of technocratic skill, but because of how they were put there, they're then serving the interests of the public much more so than any small group of people or whoever they want. So Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that more accountability in whatever form it takes not necessarily direct elections are probably what's good. So if you look at the, I think cabinet positions are a really good way of, of equating this because in other countries you'll have, uh, especially ones that have votes of no confidence, you'll see that um, for one, the whole government can just be voted out by the legislative branch. So there's lots of accountability there, right? Like they don't even need a cause. Like they just be like, I don't like your dumb, stupid face. Um, actually, <laughs> right. fun fact in, in, in Star Wars, uh, Queen Amidala calls for a vote of no confidence, and that's the nerdiest thing. Every time I watch the prequels, I'm always like, "Oh my god, I know what that means!" Right? <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, and so you'll also have this is really common in England. Uh, someone who's maybe a politician, but has some sort of expertise in a certain policy area. Right. It's not like these elected officials don't gain experience on 
policy as they're in an elected office. They're usually made to be head of like one of the ministries. And then whenever they either aren't towing the party line or there's some scandal or something, they usually write a letter saying, there's no possible way someone could handle this whole thing, even though I asked for this job. And then they resign and then a new person goes there, right? Um, so you're able to get this technocrat while also having them be accountable. Right. Well, I mean, even the, well, I mean, to be fair, the, the Bank of England is, is an independent, you know, techno, I mean, it's a political appointed position, but it's, it is an yeah. independent, you know, similar to the Fed of the chair, the chair of the Fed, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, it's independently run, but it's appointed politically, um, you know, so it kind of duplicated the system. But, uh, I think that the other thing I want to hone in on from your discussion with SDL is um, I think that you referenced uh, MMT in terms of developing economies. And yeah. um, I, I'm i willing to be wrong on this. I can't, uh, I can't see the logic, I guess, in it. You mentioned that MMT is particularly good for developing countries. And yeah. I just, can't, I don't, I can't agree with that, at least from everything that I can think. And my logic is this, that MMT falls apart when there's inflation. If there's inflation, people aren't going to be willing to buy the bonds issued in your currency because they're not like they're not getting a real return, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And you're that obviously this would explain why governments that are developing tend to issue debt um, partially in their own currency, but also partially in foreign currency. You know, hey, well, or even we'll, entirely right. Like Ecuador just uses the U.S. dollar. They've completely yes. gotten rid of all monetary autonomy. Ecuador is, is a is a, a very unique case of dollarization explicitly. Um, there's implicit dollarization like in Venezuela where people just, they, they're like, fuck the Venezuelan Boulevard. <laughs> like we can't yeah. buy me anything. Um, and so that's true as well. And there's a place for that um, because obviously if, if you're a developing nation with newly independent institutions it might make sense that investors need the confidence of a foreign currency or they need some sort of you know independence in your fiscal state or something like that and so for me mmt is is it really it only works for developed countries i would say it wouldn't work particularly well for developing countries but what, what do you yeah. what are your thoughts okay so the i brought this up in the fact that uh socialism done left made the very good point of what if we're at this like full capacity state how is it not then we just switch back to the normal way of viewing economics where if we put more money into the system inflation will happen and all that other stuff um and something that mmt uh theorists really modern monetary theory theorists uh really focus on is that there's if we're gonna focus on growth or in the case of probably looking towards the future uh, a, a shift instead of growth because let's be honest right like we live on a, a finite planet Right and climate change is coming to kill us all, so they they focus a lot on what you can do in the future that the government can, so long as there's untapped potential or even if there isn't any untapped potential, kind of steer the economy in where it creates money and where it destroys money through spending and taxation, respectively. So when I made the the comparison to developing nations, a lot of them, not all of them, but many of them have a lot of untapped capacity. Right. So I, I made the example, say there's a country that has uh, just a bunch of land that could be used for farming that it's currently not using. Um, I'm going to make uh, a comparison here. And if anyone is from any of the stands, uh, please feel free to scream at me in the comments. Uh, but from what I understand, very large portions of their workforce actually go and work abroad and send money home. Right. Uh, and so you've got like Kazakhstan, I think, is is a big one that does this. Uh, so you've got these governments that have a huge portion of their workforce basically leaving. Now, there's, from my knowledge, uh, there's quite a bit of stuff that could be done in in Kazakhstan, right? Like if it was a service oriented economy, kind of like Singapore, it could be importing the food that it needs. It could be doing all this other stuff. Uh, so if you were to look at Kazakhstan and say like, hey, you've got some capacity that you could be expanding on here. I think MMT is kind of the the right way of thinking about things where you should focus on like the goods that you need to produce, making your economy able to produce them and doing it in a way where instead of looking at overall inflation, you're focusing on the inflation of a few specific things. Um, so that was kind of what I was referring to there is that because these countries are definitely not at their their potential for what their economies are, are outputting, 
uh, either mm-hmm. because like you know the, the people are working in other countries when they could be working at home or uh, oh i guess that might be the lump labor fallacy but i don't think it, it technically is um or they've just got unused potential um i think that that's when mmt really shines one example that randall ray points out for the job guarantee love it or hate it uh, some countries have implemented something like it um is argentina where the head of a household i believe um they either started this or they're doing an experiment with it, with it i forget any argentinians uh feel free to correct me um is offered a job by the government and i believe what they're doing is instead of just giving people money up front and hoping that aggregate demand will then like aggregate demand will obviously go up if you just give people that are poor money right like they'll go and start buying things obviously um but i think the hope is that in putting them to work they're putting them to bleh, they're putting them to work um on infrastructure so that it's less costly for not only is there an increase in demand that people would then want or, or be willing to supply to it's also cheaper to supply it right so the government may not be and almost certainly is not the best one to go out and build factories and all this other stuff but if they're able to spend it on on infrastructure it's kind of like two birds with one stone where they're putting this money into the system where there wouldn't otherwise be uh where there wouldn't otherwise be and then also that demand is going to be be met somehow right i can I, that actually makes a ton of sense and i think it does alter my my view on on that statement um unfortunately it, it wasn't expounded upon a ton in, in that conversation like it was just now um but that 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 does make sense um i guess that okay. the trouble with i guess that the, the 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 tough part with developing nations is often the institutional strength and the like where the money is going towards right so mm-hmm. um if it's going towards building housing, if it's going towards uh, expanding education and healthcare access and, you know, things that we might not think about in the U.S., like running water or electricity, um, well, this is... In, like, let's be real here. Uh, I make the joke that the U.S. is kind of like a, a third world country in disguise, right? Like when you look at all of our <laughs> failing infrastructure, you That's know, fair. Like for a no, lot well, of people I, it is. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but I mean, I will, to be, I mean, everybody pretty much has electricity and, you know, like... It, it, we have running water in America. Maybe not everywhere it's clean, uh, to be fair. Yeah. But no, but I know what you mean, right? Like, but it's running. Exists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, the life of an economist, right? It's kind right. of like, look, see, right. it's technically. <laughs> hey, you know, um, take, you know, uh, progress. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're a developing nation and you're spending money on things like that, obviously um, it's, you know, unless unless the answer is 100% of your people have access to um you know competitive electricity rates access to electricity in general clean water running water education healthcare unless unless your people have full access to these things that's obviously that's affordable and that they don't you know spend half their income you know obtaining these things um and that these things yeah. are quality in nature that it that you haven't spent enough right on these things and yeah. um in your role as a you know developing economy going to a developed nation and uh that that's fair enough i guess the the issue is that um a lot of the times when countries have less independent uh monetary policy or they have a like super expansive fiscal policy um the fiscal policy is oftentimes you know under the mmt view not spent towards productive uh, capacity right mm-hmm. um and we can look yeah. at um so this is, the, this is kind of like yeah. the, the wrench that goes into everything one of the the big reasons that they advocate for a job guarantee is specifically because if you just give people money the aggregate demand will go up but it's almost certainly cheaper for people to import goods instead of build them locally and so then especially if you have a currency peg that's threatening on the peg it's like there's a lot of problems as i i like to say that problems yeah well yeah i mean i was gonna say we can look at um you know things like like venezuela or ecuador where the one of the issues that these countries had um they had very similar governing economies one was just more extreme than the other um they were both socialist wealthy uh, oil rich latin american nations um Except Ecuador wasn't. Socialist. I'm not. I'm not too familiar with uh, either of these. Do you mean socialist and the uh, socialism is when the government does stuff? Definition? Or were they like? <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I do mean so I, socialist. Uh, ostensibly, you know, they call themselves socialists when the government does stuff. Um, so I'm not okay, talking about like the actual. 
Yeah. No, of Not course, that's reasonable. Yeah. Wins, but uh, from my understanding, I don't think you can call um, <laughs> the yeah. socialist governing party in Venezuela uh, too concerned with like worker Yeah, democracy. well, per per the <laughs> per like the definition of socialism, I probably the most like socialist nation in terms of worker owned means of production is probably Argentina and South America. Um, oh really? I didn't know. I would have guessed like uh, like Switzerland or or, or Germany. No, no. Well, America. in 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 Latin America, in Latin America. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Um. Uh. Sw- Switzerland. That definitely not Switzerland. I don't think in Europe. Uh. But that's really? a story f- I, for the, another day. Some of the uh, biggest employers are, I thought, are are co-ops. Maybe they're just nominally co-ops. Right? Well, so one actually... of, and this is an interesting thing that you that you can look into. I I have done like a my most viewed videos is my worker cooperative video and i've done so much research on worker cooperatives and market socialism oh, okay. uh one of the problems when looking at like co-ops is that a lot of the time co-ops are quotation co-ops right which is to say that when a market socialist refers to a co-op they're talking about a worker cooperative where workers own the company equally right that there's 10 employees they each own a tenth of the company they get a tenth of the profits or they assume a tenth of the losses right um the problem is that a lot of the times like when people talk about french cooperatives um those are actually only uh partially owned by uh workers and the partial ownership of workers isn't equally distributed right um when people talk about finnish uh, uh farming cooperatives those aren't worker cooperatives in any sense. They're producer cooperatives where each individual farm is essentially a traditionally organized firm, but they pool their resources. Exactly. They pool their resources to get better deals on, on input costs. Right. Um, which isn't, it's not worker democracy by any means. Oh, kind um, of like, uh, kind of like, um, true value in the United States, the hardware thing, that, uh, a bunch of hardware stores, like small, Right. Family owned hardware stores. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We have farming cooperatives in the US too, but the, the third the third category is consumer cooperatives, which is like the most crazily mislabeled <laughs> thing. I, yeah, I know I am aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like a consumer cooperative is so not a worker cooperative. <laughs> like it's a good thing, but it's just it's not like if you have a bunch of consumer cooperatives, you're not anywhere closer to a market socialist society than than what we are to, I don't know, just, I don't know. The point is, though, is that um, to get way, way back to the to the point, which was that um, they had, Ecuador and Venezuela had very similar governing economies. They were ostensibly socialist, they were Latin and American, and then they uh, had uh, oil, oil wealth. The only difference being that um, Ecuador had slightly more productive spending in the economy, and they had less of a bureaucratic state uh, regarding their oil wealth, um, probably because they had uh, uh, their, their their president was Rafael Correa, who is a, a doctoral economist from the Chicago School, um, and uh, he probably had a better grasp on the economy than Hugo Chavez or, or Nicolas Maduro, um, though he was uh, not exactly the most uh, transparent or, or lacking in corruption individual rafael correa i mean when you're dealing with latin america right like you kind of take what you can get in regards to transparency well, sure yeah and and so um what ended up happening with both of these nations though is that um they both experienced fiscal crises ecuador not as much so because they weren't as dependent on oil but a lot of their fiscal crisis um had to do with the bloated uh, oil wealth of their nation that uh, their production per employee went down substantially after uh, nationalization and over time because a lot of the times production uh, of the oil you mean after they nationalized pr- production of the oil like per like efficiency production like per employee and you know things okay, like that I just wasn't um, sure if you meant like the, the rest of the economy went down per person right no 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 and yeah, the oil specifically okay yeah and it's because the you know the large state owned enterprises were a way to employ people uh, in terms of ingratiating them into the government's popularity. Um, but these employees, it, it just, it wasn't productive. It was bloated, right? And this is where some of the inflation problems and the fiscal constraint can come in. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's the reality for a lot of developing governments that engage in expansionary fiscal policy is that oftentimes it's not uh, productive expansion it's it's a more corrupt kind of bureaucratic expansion that doesn't necessarily lead to better outcomes 
if, if I if you can uh kind of uh <laughs> if you can put up with my uh syndicalism for a hot minute here um I see a lot of issue with um craft unionism in the U.S. uh are you familiar with the term craft union is it the same thing as a trade union no okay so um Socialists will distinguish between types of unions. So the most ununion of unions is a company union, which is just a union set up by the company. Uh, it's obviously not even like remotely what we're on about. Uh, the industrial workers of the world, it might sound like you have to hold a hammer and use a riveting gun every day, but uh, industrial unions are meant to be uh, unions for every type of worker from all across the the economy basically they're open to everybody right like the iww right. the internet the industrial workers of the world you can even be a member of another union what if i was a hedge fund economy. analyst could i be part of the iww no, i believe the requirements are you can't hire or fire you can't be a politician um and no cops i think those are the uh, okay so i can be i can be yeah. a big big money ball and investment banker and be part of the the international as workers as you union can't hire or fire yeah hell yeah brother that's how I we do it right i mean equality <laughs> talk to, talk worker to solidarity <laughs> <laughs> um they're they're kind of like the 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 biggest reaching union they're also very critical of the capital structure right so they they right. absolutely want to replace uh like this kind of situation where a minority of the people who uh, are involved in in the company. I don't kind of really buy the fact that uh, bosses do nothing. A lot of bosses do nothing, but uh, some of them, again, they do have skills that that go there. I support democracy at the workplace, not because the the best people are going to be put in the positions of power, but the people who are in the positions of power are now beholden to more people than just like I don't know investors or whatever. Um, so they kind of view they critique capitalism very heavily. Uh, the IWW, their actual plan is to eventually, when they have enough workers, uh, they want to expand wide, right? And since they allow you to be in another union, they kind of just like will assist. They'll use all their resources to kind of do local general strikes or, or, or local strikes. Uh, and as they expand and they have this big pot of money, they're going to be able to provide social services for their members to then attract more people. And eventually they'll supplant the state and then, you know, world revolution and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so that's kind of like the, I don't know, the, the most based, I guess, of all the unions. Then you've got trade unions, which are unions that are based around a specific skill set, right? So they're they're not open to unskilled workers, uh, which the IWW is. Um, the, these are kind of like, uh, I want to say like, uh, if, if a bunch of people who worked at a company Right, like if all the steel workers at the the steel working plant, they'd be part of like a trade union, and then you've got craft unions, which are even more exclusive. So these would be, like, you could have a company and the Teamsters, and some other union are both working at the same company, and these unions don't critique the capitalist structure, right? They they just view it as inherent, right? They've kind of accepted capitalism, and so a lot of what they fight for isn't stronger worker control in how the, the company is run, stronger worker say in how it's run. It's basically just when you're at that point where you can't view beyond capitalism, you just fight for the preservation of jobs. And so this is the stereotype of like, oh, yeah, this is the union where, right, they get organized. It's most it's usually not democratic, right? Like, I don't have to tell you that the Teamsters are like, you know, Jimmy Hoffa, just Google Jimmy Hoffa. Um this is where like you get that idea of like oh yes the the union where they have the guy who watches the guy who digs the hole right uh and so when you mentioned that in ecuador they kind of had all these government jobs that were just bloated right like people sitting around doing nothing uh i kind of view that as as very much in a similar way right like even though it was the state operating this i would say that it's probably uh more equatable to to state capitalism in that like did these workers get a say in 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 how it was run uh, because some nationalization efforts uh, that have been more on the democratic side have been more successful in in increasing production, right? Sorry for the stuttering there. Um, I believe when the UK nationalized uh, its coal industry, and I could be wrong, uh, it was a fair bit democratic and production increased afterwards, right? Like obviously the, the reason that uh, a private structure, right, like a kind of dictatorial hierarchy in companies works is that the, the people at the top are, you know, they want to make money, whereas the state, it doesn't really need to make money on its enterprises. So 
it, it kind of has a malfunction there. So I would say that if you're a developing country, you kind of really need to focus on making sure that the hierarchies that you're putting money into um, are democratically controlled. And the ones that have control of the money are as democratic as possible. Because, I mean, if you give a king a money printing press, he's going to print money for himself. But if you give everybody, right, collectively one money printing press, they're going to have to decide how they're going to spend it. Right. That's that's not an unreasonable analysis. I, I think that, um, you know, there, there are examples... No, I understand. Well, there. I mean, there, I could, I could, I could see the possibility that the national that nationalization can result in more efficient access to resources. I mean, the best example would be the single payer healthcare system versus the system we have in America, like a single payer system where uh, hospitals are mostly state run, and that you have the government as the the insurance provider would uh, certainly yeah. be more effective at extending uh, access and affordable access to healthcare than than what we have today. Um, but also, like, for instance, I can see a scenario where, like, um, say that in the days of Standard Oil, say that the government decided to nationalize the oil industry instead of just break them up. Um, I could see yeah. that in a scenario where you've got a company with monopoly power, which is um, artificially constricting the supply to the market in order to extract premium, you know, just classic basic economic, that that would extend um, more efficiency and more production to the market than otherwise. Um, I think that in the but that's that would only be for a temporary period of time though i think that what you'd see similarly is probably what you'd see in in ecuador and in in venezuela just just the idea that you know expansionary fiscal states for developing countries are great but they should be seen with um some level of skepticism uh because without the targeted uh you know uh, productive relief of the expansionary fiscal state um, you might devolve into basically like, well, yeah, let's just put like half of the population on the government payroll and that way we can win elections pretty easily, you know? And it's like, well, yeah. that's not very good, it's, you know? It's yeah. not a... I think that, that, that that really does come down to a lot of it though, right? Is like if the workers see their only viable place of employ as being part of the state, right? Like why would they ever... Uh, my, my Republican dad critiques... Uh, complains about this a lot he says the government provides too good of benefits why would anyone work for the private sector uh and i say like it sounds like the private sector needs to up their game a little bit um and he gets a little upset right he's like too many people work for the government and i'm like well right if you had a choice between like working for the local sounds a little council, jealous right? yeah he does sound a little <laughs> jealous right <laughs> co work um, at the post office dad geez <laughs> yeah and so i told him i'm like okay dad well like consider the the benefits of working for like the local government or even the federal government right like you get even though it's a very tiny say you get more say in in what your life is like and what your work life is like there than if you were to work for like some private company right like disregarding all the benefits you get and uh you know all of that stuff it's, it's i think that there is definitely a risk of when the government steps in and people don't have a desire or even know that there could be an alternative where they themselves are like involved in private enterprise in like a market socialist thing or in whatever you want right you're definitely going to get this thing where people just get paid to sit around because we see this in uh, our modern economy right have you heard of the book bullshit jobs um i i, I have heard of it yeah okay uh so this is a great read david graber is not an economist uh the author who wrote it he is an anthropologist, so don't expect some... Wow, so why should I even about... give a fuck about what he yeah, thinks? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you should because he's he's a cool guy. Uh, All right, that's and fair. And he died. Yeah. No, he actually recently died, which is unfortunate. Um, and I think his uh, wife or domestic partner or girlfriend or whatever said, like, the circumstances of his death were not suspicious. And I'm like, I didn't think anyone suspected that there to be any foul player until you said that out loud, lady. Good like, God. Yeah, right? Like, now I'm thinking, like, okay, like, <laughs> which like, capitalist which cabal like, oh, really doesn't yeah. fuck around. <laughs> right? Um, but anyway, he wrote a book called Bullshit Jobs where he basically talks about how much current waste there is, like, even in the way we currently run stuff, right? Like, just because of how hierarchical, he, he kind of says it without ever actually saying it. Um, fair disclaimer, he's a straight-up anarchist, and he says it out loud in his book, right? 
like I, I always like that when people state their bias right out front and then tell you where they're coming like they they're like like hey i'm a whatever and then you tell them right like just state your bias i like that uh he basically says like whenever he would talk about how much inefficiency there is and all these bullshit jobs where people basically get paid to do nothing um he says like this is supposed to be a thing that like the soviet union did right like we won the cold war because we didn't have all this stuff and he says whenever he talks to people right like he would talk to economists about this uh and he would say like i don't have a lot of data on this but like i've talked to a lot of people you know kind of like the preliminary thing right like he's just an anthropologist that's what he does he would talk to these people and so many of them would have would have stories about how like their job is basically worthless they if, if they stopped doing their job the company would be the same why does it exist and he would always get a lot of pushback right he said like they would do this tautology thing where they would say like oh it's a job by the created by the free market it has to be doing something because it was a job created by the free market the free market doesn't create useless jobs right it'd be unprofitable to do so and he's like all right but can we just pretend we're in make-believe land uh <laughs> there's a lot of bullshit jobs out there yeah so i think it, right. it does come down to the like you're gonna get bullshit jobs no matter where you are kind of i guess that's fair. I mean, it's 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 kind of it, well, it depends on the scale, right? So, like, obviously, Absolutely. in the right, so it's it's similar to like the the federal government is uh sometimes well, let's put it this way: the federal government is always bigger at doing shit than the private market if they want to be. Um, that also means that they can be much much worse or much much better at doing those things. Um. A yeah. case where they're much, much better would be like the welfare state. Like when libertarians talk about abolishing the welfare state and, oh, like private charities and churches and mosques will just like fill that void. It's like that is not true and it's not demonstrated Absolutely in any not. system across the entire history of like central government. Like if we also, don't have... Even if it were equal, I would argue that you wouldn't want all of those institutions doing it because at least with the state, this is the one hierarchy that you get a say in, in how it it, it happens right like if it was just a bunch of private charities right this is kind of the thing where uh right. people who are on the left and get angry about everything they say why do we need bill gates to go solve malaria in africa why can't we decide how we spend our money why do we have to hope these billionaires bless us with their kindness well right and also i just i wouldn't like the idea of like like it's kind of nice that there is a a an independent body determining benefit like for instance i wouldn't like the idea of like like say we had a huge charity and it was awesome and they gave a lot of good aid to people. Well, I wouldn't like the idea that they're like, oh, like we found you, we found that you like tweeted out Trump twenty twenty. Well, we're not going to give you like your like your food aid this month. And it's like, okay, I yeah. get it, right? Like the dude's a Trump supporter, but he probably shouldn't go hungry, you know, because yeah, he's a Trump well, supporter I was, or, or vice yeah. versa, you know. So I was I, thinking that when I got my my stimmy, I got my stimmy uh, last Wednesday, and I was like, wow, I didn't. I didn't even vote for Biden, right? Like I voted third party like a loser, you know, feel free to shit on me on Twitter. Um, I have no comment. I was like, wow. <laughs> um, uh, I voted for the ghost of Karl Marx. That's a lie. Uh, and I was like, wow, I, I, I got money from the government, right? And it's, I, I think that the, so I'm a fan of selectorate theory, which is this really nerdy theory in political science. Um, if you want the summary of it, go watch CGP Gray's Rules for Rulers. If you want a more in-depth summary, read The Dictator's Handbook. Yeah. Um, and if, yeah. I've seen it. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So I actually bought, like, the opus, right? Like, the book that um, Bruce Buena de Mesquita and Alistair Smith, like, their actual theoretical outlining of selectorate theory. Uh, and I read that. It's on my shelf. It's nice. I'm going to meet them in person. I'm going to have them sign it. Uh and I kind of say, like, the more people that someone is accountable to, the, excuse me, sorry, I'm like burping. The more people that someone is uh, accountable to, to get to their current position, the more that the the benefits that they pay out are going to be just like general things. So the, the specific thing they say is that once you get beyond a certain point, it's more cost effective, given that you have limited resources to spend it on public goods rather than just a bunch of private goods, right? So if you've got a million dollars coming in and you need to get a million people on your side, you should probably not just end up giving each one of them a dollar. You should probably, you know, spend that million dollars on something that'll make the million of them happy, right? Whereas if you only had three people to spend it, then yeah, sure, just give each one $333,000. Right. Yeah. Right. And the other, the other side of that coin, what I was going to say was that 
you know, giving um, the side of the federal government can also mean that if they overinvest in certain bad things, well, it can be a lot worse than any individual company. And to kind of reiterate the point, you know, labor can be an example of that where, you know, you <clears throat> I've seen it, I've seen Reddit posts like this before where it's like, you know, it'll normally go something like this. It's like, oh, my um, like I'm a, like I'm an engineer at an oil company and my uh, my boss left and they didn't hire an analyst under me uh, or like uh, my my company merged with another company and somehow some way I just don't have any responsibility now and nobody has noticed and I've seen multiple posts like that where it's like yeah I just don't even go to work I don't do anything nobody asks me for anything but I get paid six grand a month and I like it you know a lot of times they complain about it like oh like this it's so boring and it's like dude just I no, hate you, read, you. Yeah. <laughs> like, no you should read Graber's book he, he talks about this actually he talks about okay. people who live this position and they actually get really depressed because uh so it all started because he wrote this essay about this idea that he had that there were a lot of bullshit jobs around, you know, having had a few himself, I think. Uh, and it like exploded, right? Uh, and this, I believe it was a British newspaper, a British polling agency asked the the public, like specifically, like, do you feel that if your job stopped existing, it would have any meaningful impact on your company or society? I forget exactly what it was. Uh, and I think something like 40% of people said that they felt that this was what their job was was like. And he said, like, this isn't just people who actually sit around and do nothing and get paid for it, right? Like, this is some people who, like, there was one where uh, this woman worked at a senior citizen home and her boss was, like, really keen on her going and having every resident in the whole thing fill out these surveys at the end of each week about, like, all this stuff. And she said, I would have them do all these surveys they would get put into a folder and stuck in a filing cabinet and never touched. Right. Like why is there right. <laughs> seemingly all? No, that's fair. That's fair. But I think that, I think that the, the reason a lot of people in the UK would say that, like I would say the same thing. Right. And I wouldn't say that because my job isn't meaningful. I would say it because, well, my job is meaningful, but I can also be replaced. And also at the same time, there are people at my company who can do what I do, but at the same time, uh, like I provide a lot of relief for them. You know, for instance, like the CFO can run the accounting books, but there's a reason that the CFO does not run the accounting books because they're doing other things, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I think that that might explain some portion of that 40%. And this is all to say that I think that with a, a decentralized, you know, privately organized or collectively organized labor market in the case of worker cooperatives, um, you would you would you would certainly get uh, a lot less of these bullshit jobs of these like unproductive uh, jobs and and it would be more so slipping through the cracks than a function of the system in the case of yeah. a you know a, an expansionist developing country just putting people on the payroll to turn a wrench you know once an hour um, yeah. and it's you know just not very productive right these are very different things at very different scales. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm a I guess I'll get canceled by the current online left, but uh, I like people who work hard, right? Uh, call me old fashioned. Go fuck yourself. Um, yeah, right. But I don't think that anyone should have to work to like survive, for example. So, right, like I'm okay with there being bullshit jobs uh, as long as we all agree on who should be doing those bullshit jobs. So, for example, uh, sitting around watching TV all day, um, if you are in any way uh, less than fully capable of functioning in society under the current stresses that involves whether you have a physical disability or a a mental disability or you're neurally typical right like i think that you just existing you should be able to get paid for that and right now we have some say over who should be able to do these quote unquote bullshit jobs right but there are ones that exist that we probably wouldn't want them to exist right i kind of think if you look at like okay there's this veteran and him sitting around all day at his house right just watching tv he gets really depressed and so the the local town hired him to just be a greeter at city hall i'm like obviously that's a bullshit job but i'd personally be okay with that right like if he's gonna get the benefit anyway i'm I'm fine if if like i would vote for a yes on that but right now you have all these right. bullshit jobs where you know we don't actually get to decide what what they are right like you, you kind of said right. this before is like the bullshit jobs they're 
they're an inherent part of the system in the way that we have them now but we also have like welfare recipients and and whatnot that are also inherent to our system right it's kind of like there's always going to be some bullshit but right it's going to manifest itself in different ways right yeah exactly and i think it's it's one of the reasons that like like i'm not sold on a ubi versus a negative income tax but in in the ubi experiments that have been done it doesn't seem to be the Mm -hmm. case that people just fuck off and don't work anymore it seems that rather what you're doing when you provide some basic assistance to people or a basic sort of you know backup in the form of a of a of a of a state funded uh basic assistance program uh you yeah. don't see people just rely on basic assistance instead you 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 actually see them have more negotiating power with their employer like hey if you don't yeah. pay me more I'll just fucking leave right or I'll start my own business yeah. or you know whatever right um, I actually really yeah. support the UBI for that exact instance is think about how much easier collective bargaining or even a strike is when right. you don't well, have to worry about UBI or negative income tax or basic assistance like the Nordic countries. I mean, it's functionally, it's, yeah. the, it's the same goal, which is just, you know, providing some sort of a backup for people who um, are either unsatisfied with their employment or get mm-hmm. laid off or there's, you know, like, for instance, if you're a, a coal worker and your job becomes obsolete, you know, things like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that's all that's all reasonable and fair enough. I think that the issue though is that um y- you know, I, I, again, you know, I think we've 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 hit the we've kind of talked about this, but developing I guess developing countries in theory you're right. MMT would be dope as fuck for developing countries. Um assuming <laughs> well, I can't believe you, you know, did a 180 here. <laughs> well, no, but it's in theory though. That's my point. Is like in theory oh, like yeah. MMT would be would be great, right? That you know, pay hey, fiscal expansion and product in in the in the less than at full productive capacity of the economy. Um, you know, the the congresses and the parliaments of these developing countries are responsible and you know understand the dangers of inflation. Um, but these two things just they just don't happen. They just don't for one reason or another. People are short term thinking. I think is the the biggest explanation. But um, okay. like it. it they they just don't you know and that's why you know mmt just it falls apart um to me on the on the on the merits of the prescriptions but also the 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 practicality and political implications of the prescriptions okay uh i think that if you if you're really concerned about that which i think you you should be right i don't think that you need to have the government taking a very active role in the economy if the like you can let me see how i can do this so you've got automatic stabilizers right like progressive income taxes and unemployment benefits are the go-to example where just as the economy starts heading into a recession tax revenue for the government is going to start going down and benefits to poor people are going to start going up so an mmt would say like okay remember that this isn't a transfer of money this is just deleting money in some places and creating it in others and as a recession is happening, we're deleting less money and we're putting more money in. So just that system itself is kind of an MMT system. So if you wanted to get uh, an implementation, I guess, of like, say you're a developing nation and you're very worried about corruption. I don't know how you got to be in this decision-making position, right? Um, where you can, you know, not have to worry about corruption, but say you're there, Right. Uh, you could implement stuff that are kind of like automatic stabilizers, but slightly more robustly in order to prevent those those kinds of issues, right? Like uh, the the job guarantee, you'll often hear it called an employer of last resort. Um, and I believe Randall Ray in his book argues that it should be slightly below the minimum wage. I could be wrong. That way it, it is kind of like a, you'll only go here if there's nothing else left in the private sector. And you're employed for a specific amount of time, and then you're kind of kicked off and you go back to the economy, right? So I think that that's probably a much better way of doing it. Because even if it is just ending up being like a cash transfer for a certain amount of time, you kind of avoid a little bit of the... Yeah, I think I just convinced myself that I'm not a fan of the job guarantee. I'm more a fan of cash transfers. But again, it depends on the country. That's fair enough. I mean, I think that that kind of exhausts the... The scope of the conversation um uh you know unless there's anything else you wanted to bring up i have a cool source to send you uh so this was a a the the world bank what are you a capitalist shield yeah so here actually this is (laughs) this is really good 
Uh, this was, <laughs> I forget what they did. They looked at uh, the effect of cash transfers on consumption of temptation goods, right? Like they gave, they gave free money to poor people in Africa. Uh, and they were like shocked, shocked that they spent it on like food for their families and housing and business startups instead of like <laughs> crack cocaine. And I'm like, yeah, who would have guessed that? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it was just something you mentioned earlier. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I think that that's kind of like, like, that's another one of those weird, like, it's one of those conjecture type criticisms of things like the UBI where like, again, there's, there's. There are reasonable criticisms of the UBI, but an unreasonable criticism is like, oh, people are just going to spend it on drugs. And it's like, yeah. okay, but number one, like, I, I I, don't think that that's true. But even if some people are like, I'm so addicted to heroin, I'm going to set up a bank account and get my UBI and spend $1,000 a month on heroin or something. It's like, maybe that person does exist, like in, in a, you know, in a program with 200, 300 million people who are participating, yeah, there's probably some people doing that, but you have to weigh that against yeah. the net benefit of like potentially millions of people being lifted out of poverty, being 100%. given, you know, more negotiating yeah. power for their wages, things like I, that. I mean, I always say this when it comes to government programs, right? And I think this applies to everything, even if you're concerned about uh, the corruption problems that could happen or the, the bullshit job creation that could happen from uh, using MMT to just like pump money into the economy uh you're always going to have uh error on your government policy right either it's not going to cover enough of what you want it to or it's going to go too far um and i equate it to you're about to drive over a bridge would you rather the engineer designed it to go above its capacity or to be slightly below its capacity right Right. Yeah. So as you said, like even if there is this guy who's you know taking government money and giving it to his local drug dealer to to buy heroin, I think if you look on the whole, right, the argument shouldn't be that oh some of these people exist. It should be, is that really as big of a problem that it outweighs the the other benefits here? 